All right, well, welcome everybody. And today's channeling showcase guest is Greg. And I never know how to pronounce your surname, Greg. So tell me if I say it wrong. Greg <laughs> Dantzerau, is that correct? Dantzerau, very good, yes. And Greg is, he describes himself as an explorer of the higher human abilities. And he is very experienced in the practical use of non-local awareness. And he just loves to play and learn and develop. And he's into all of this intuitive stuff. And he offers his services and his expertise through community support, coaching, and mentorship for individuals and leaders. So welcome, Greg. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a few sort of personal questions before we get into the channeling. And my first question is why channeling? What what does channeling mean to you? What attracted you to it? Uh, it's funny <clears throat> because I don't know that I, I chose this. It kind of found me. <laughs> um, and maybe part of it was when I started getting into the professional coaching development, um, I have a habit where I like to dig up 100-year-old books. So I started looking for old books on the history of coaching and psychology and that kind of thing. And what I found was all of this is rooted in the old medicine man, the old shaman. So I thought, well, maybe I can open my mind a little bit to other possibilities. So then I learned uh, from you that we're all channel beings, and that kind of opened a doorway for me because this is no longer something that's nefarious and scary. It's now just part of our experience. And what can we do yeah, if we pull that through and allow more of it? So that's how I found my way here. Wonderful. And you describe those whom you channel as the council. Can you tell mm -hmm. us more mm -hmm. about who the council is, what your concept of them is? Well, when I go in, what I experience is almost like a round table where there's there's a, a group of people who are there with an immense amount of support for us in what we do. And I often have this belief that everyone's experience is the same as mine, and I talk that way, but maybe everyone's is not. When I go in and experience it, what I see is a group of people, and sometimes some of them have something important to say. Uh, sometimes some of them are prominent, and and a few of them that are prominent, one of them is Melchizedek with his intense blue eyes and very uh, commanding view. The other one that is always there is Shem uh, with that Egyptian lineage. Um, and there's others that I would describe as, um, like one feels like Nikola Tesla, but does not look like that. Uh, so there's there's a range of these beings. And, and one of them is just me. The, the the larger version of me i would say mm -hmm. very cool and so depending on what kind of questions we ask you we might get different <laughs> ones coming forward so that's very yeah. exciting so how has this so far helped you on your personal journey how's channeling helped you personally so I'm breathing through. I can feel the energy of the group as we stepped in here today. So I'm just breathing through the the nervousness or a little bit of intensity in here. It's helped me manage my energy like I just did. Um, it's helped me start to allow that um, intensity that I have in my heart out through my voice. Um, and it's allowed me to uh, find ways to explore more of what's possible for, for all humans and in an experiential way. And it's interesting because when I experience, uh, this drives me to want to share. So the more I experience and the more good things are happening for me, the more I wanna be out there sharing with others and helping others to find a positive experience. So it's helped me in that way. And I guess I could say this is part of my life work, part of my purpose. Would you recommend that other people try channeling? Do you think channeling is for everyone? Yeah, absolutely. And I yeah. go back to that. We are all channel beings. And when I work with clients, 
I've had a few breakthroughs with clients where they realize that there is a higher version. There is a bigger me, and I can bring more of that through. I actually had a client the other day uh, in, in a meditative state. She observed her old skin fall off, and she walked out a new version of herself um, after realizing there's more of me. Yes, everyone should channel. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And one last question, because you've been doing the um, channeling course. Um, what, what have you liked most about that so far? How's that helped you? Well, there's a broad range of topics that are covered in there. So um, it, it's more of that expansion of what's possible, a uh, different way of viewing what's out there, the history of humanity, um, and understanding more of what we are and trying to handle this feeling of separation that we get stuck with in the human form. Um, yeah, and that uh, ability to experience the fact that there is actually oneness and no such thing. But we always come back to, yeah, I feel pretty alone right now, but I can go and experience a different thing with these tools and with that training. Yeah. That's wonderful and it's the perfect segue into the first question I wanted to ask the council mm -hmm. so okay. um, shall we give you a moment so mm -hmm. that you can go into the channeling state and then just let us know when you're ready okay. We're ready. Well, thank you very much for being here and talking to us. So here we all sit in our flesh and blood bodies in our human uh, state. And I was wondering, what is it to be human from your perspective? Because we can only have a perspective from within the experience, but you can bring us an ex um, a perspective observing the experience that we're having. So what is it to be human? The image that comes first is the image of the peacock. And when you look at the spread feathers of the tail, all the different um, eyes that you see on the tail and how even though it's one peacock, each of these eyes, if they were eyes, has a different view of what's going on, and that can represent a different experience. What it means to be human is to be imperfect and feel. We're here in this body because the body allows us to experience density and everything that comes with that, the highs and the lows, the emotion, the density. All of this, what it does is it creates expansion and what the universe wants is expansion. So when we, we come in experience and we make choices that create something new that wasn't before, now there's expansion and this allows another human to come and find that path and maybe take it further. So this allows, through human form, the creation of cellular memory that gives back to consciousness and then can create expansion in the universe. I really enjoyed the metaphor of the peacock. Um, I felt like that was a very um, inclusive um that it brings us all together because we experience ourselves as these separate points of focus and yet here all of these separate points of focus are part of the same being the peacock so it's a nod to the oneness that we all are and then that made me think well what is the body of the peacock and it could be god or it could be the soul and i wanted i've asked you what is it to be human what 
is the human soul? What is the nature of the human soul? Oh, we see the the universe and a spark all at the same time here. So the the soul is the soul is consciousness. The soul is everything. Um, and if you take when when new life is formed, when the cells join in the mother, there's a spark of life that's added in at that point, and this is a portion of consciousness that's now there. And each portion has its unique uniqueness and, and some of this is brought through mathematic formula but each each portion of consciousness that comes through is part of the larger whole having its individual experience through that life form and this happens through choice so at a high level everything returns to one And beyond that, the many portions of the one are here in an individuated form, walking through a path that allows them to remember that we are one. So many of us do feel very separate when we're here. And often humans, when they talk about the, their soul, it's some far off thing <laughs> that they don't mm. really um, know what it is. They talk about it as though it's my soul, like something that exists outside of me. So can you talk more about the relationship between the human and the human soul to help us shift our perspective and understanding about it? So we see many humans walking on the planet. And if we look at the, the modern view of this, they're in the bow, you know, distracted with devices and detached. There's a detachment <clears throat> happening on a broad scale in humanity now that disconnects from, from soul or what could be described as heart. So... The soul is within all people, but not, not all people are maintaining a connection to that higher being. It's as though there's been a teaching of numbing, numbing out um, of detachment of, and in a way, this numbing out is actually what allows so many things that happen on the planet that aren't good. It allows that to happen. If everyone were in more contact with their soul, with the higher being, with that understanding, it would create more freedom, more acceptance, and a, a new world. So... Where are we? So you talked about how a, a shift in our consciousness would create create a shift in our um, in our world. Well, maybe another question is um, where are we in our evolution right now, and where are we headed? So if we were to form an image here, we see an image at our feet of a planet and above our head of a planet and uh, people in between. So where are we now is many people are stuck in an old way of being, an old existence. And if you imagine people clinging to trees and holding on to this as if they don't want to let go, because there's a lot of fear here. And these people are all trembling. There's a lot of fear that keep us in, in the world and in the state that we are. If you go to the in-between place where a, an individual, a soul can have awareness of the fact that they don't have to have the dense experience. They don't have to stay 
in that environment that can choose something different, you can rise above it in a way with an understanding that we can reach down there and interact in that way. And we can be above that experience and have something different. And this now allows a looking forward or looking up at what might be possible, what might be developed, and what's being formed in a very real way now is what some refer to as the new world, a new way of being. And an image here now starts to create what we see as people coming from the old density, almost as if gravity has shifted and they're landing on the new, new planet, new Earth. And it's as though this part is not a choice, that it's an inevitability, it's going to happen. It's been magnetized to the point where people are going to be taken to the new world, to the new way of existing. And again, this is by choice. So, I'm also very interested in kind of like, I guess, the mechanics of the changes that are happening on our planet. Because my understanding is that there are, there's a cosmic shift. <laughs> it's happening on the level of, you know, the entire cosmos, definitely the Milky Way galaxy um, and our solar system and our sun is having some very active phases. So can they talk a little bit on what is going on energetically in our reality and how that is impacting us? And how is that impacting the human body to be in those changing frequencies? So we talked for a moment about each person coming here and, and living a life that gives back and creates expansion. So there's always expansion. And we see Calvin here saying, change is inevitable. So with the volume of people that we have on the planet, and now the tide turning where more and more people are what they call enlightened and looking for a new experience, this creates. It creates first in energy, but above this, there's divine guidance and a pull. And this pull is magnetic. And there's activations that come with this in, in the universe, in the cosmos, the energy has shifted and this is now being absorbed into all humans. It's being transmitted into us. And we see DNA here where now there's DNA activation and a shift within the human. The human is changing. And this is a lighter form of a human, almost as if there's a light body. Instead of the density that was, there's a new, lighter form, lighter way of being. So there's change everywhere. The universe within creates universe, creates change in the universe without. And vice versa. So we're a little bit like caterpillars turning to butterflies. And in a way, we're in the cocoon right now, we're dissolving the old body and creating a new form. And that comes with, I think that the ones who have a level of spiritual consciousness and spiritual techniques um, have an easier ride, but even for them it can be um, challenging and so the whole of humanity is in a kind of major growth cycle and the personal human experience of it can be quite challenging you know because especially if people resist the change <laughs> because it seems we I mean in order to lighten the load we have to drop away our density and many humans have been here for many incarnations and collected quite a bit of um, 
density. So what guidance do you have to help us as we go through these times of challenging internal growth where we may be experiencing um, pain that we've stored in our system pouring out of us, which is uncomfortable. Um, how can you help us navigate the changes that we're talking about on a personal human level? Well, we have two, two balls of energy here, two answers. And we want to make sure that we come back to both. The first that comes up is on the the pain uh, that people are experiencing, the discomfort that people are experiencing. And, and what comes with this is an opportunity. Um, and maybe there needs to be an understanding that this happens because to heal, we need to feel. So when we... When we allow hmm, a lot of energy in that one, when we allow the feeling to happen and we we move through that pain and we allow the feelings to happen and come out the other side, that's allowed the healing to occur. That means that it doesn't have to go any further. And that ball of energy is empty now. The other There's lots of people now becoming aware of things that don't understand. There's people exploring the, the dream space with no control over what's up there and realizing that things are happening with them and they want to know if they're okay because <clears throat> there's no reference point for any of this. There's no school to go to that teaches that Astral travel is actually normal and something that can happen every night and we can interact with it. There's no understanding that a larger part of us doesn't need to sleep. And when the body rests, there's other things that are possible. And as more people wake up to these, there's a need for understanding, maybe validation, of these skills and abilities and for people to know that they're okay. This is a letting go of the framework of what we understand the human to be. This is an expansion of possibility and minds, a flowering, or as you said, the butterfly coming out of the cocoon. Thank you for both of those <laughs> balls of wisdom. I think I'd like to perhaps explore each one a little bit further. And so maybe the first one first, because I, I think we need a lot of practical help in our world at the moment. And um, we probably all know people who are in denial of the pain that that is coming up in their system. And so people can get into a lot of resistance, a lot of denial. It makes the whole growth cycle last longer. The more you resist, it persists. And I have observed sometimes as well that people will seek a escapism. Now, that escapism could be addictions. It could equally be escapism into out-of-body experience so as not to, to have to experience what they're going through in the human experience. So can you talk a little bit about denial of pain and how we um, seek to escape the pain? and what we can do about that. Yeah, the spiritual communities are rife with the escapism and, and, and what many of them attempt to frame as uh, divinity and ceremony, um, but it is escape of, of pain. And this concept of um, prolonging the pain, prolonging the difficulty is very true. 
um, this is resistance, resistance to the change. And what, what humans struggle with is the surrender. And part of this is because there's a disconnect from two things. There's a disconnect from ancestry. There's a disconnect, three things. There's a disconnect from the planet Earth. And there's a disconnect from the higher being what some would call God, what some would call the universe. And without these things, and humanity has been in this place before, without these things, you get escapism, short-term gain. And the other important thing here is, as people hold on to the pain and put it away and not feel it, this causes dis-ease. This, this comes out of the body in other ways, and more and more of this is showing up on the planet now in in dark spots and mm, loss of mind and loss of memory, loss. So rather than going through the pain and finding surrender and, and seeking something that helps, uh, people are escaping sometimes with the help of professionals, sometimes alone, sometimes in community. There was something else here that we want back. The surrender. The way to walk through it is to find a place of spirituality a place where you can create, a place where you can stand in the waterfall. A lot of energy in that. There's three ways to make it different. Spirituality, creativity, connection to nature. That sent off me off in many multi-dimensional threads of questions <laughs> so I guess I have to pick one um I had wanted to ask you about the disconnection from the earth and so I think this is a good opportunity to ask about uh, how we are our relationship with our planet and perhaps what the intended relationship or the evolved relationship would look like compared to what our current relationship is there's lots of uh, images and feelings that came with this one the the if we look at the scarring of the planet and and the puking of of resources and over consumerism and the things that people that hold on to that they they feel have value it's all misplaced there's a perception in this um environment that the the man stands on top of it as the ultimate being and this is simply not true and there's almost a rumbling in the earth as the earth wants humanity to know you need me and i don't need you so there's a concept that we're going to destroy the planet, but the truth is we're going to harm ourselves unless we find a different way. The planet will continue just as it has through other civilizations that we see evidence of in the past. And we see pyramids and ruins here and bones buried in layers in the earth. So a new way of being sees humanity more dispersed and in a way smaller than nature and integrated with it. So if we say there is a mutual, mutual love in this environment, there's abundance and no hoarding. And, and what we see here is the, the fact that if you observed animals in, in nature, 
they take what they need uh, and they have this sense of what they need and they don't go beyond that. This is abundance. There's enough for everyone. It's just a matter of letting go and remembering what we truly are and how we can relate to this planet that we are reliant upon. Thank you. So when you were talking about how humans are disconnected, you mentioned three things, the earth, God, and a third one, which surprised me because I'd never actually thought about that one, was ancestry. So mm. can you expand on this, what, what was meant by the disconnection from ancestry? Um, the room just filled up here. Um, there's teaching on the planet that, um, in the human form, death comes and that's the end of things. Uh, and we carry out life in this way. And if we were to point a finger, we would say that uh, there's been use of um, fear and shame in some systems to develop a belief system that mm, we are here, there's something wrong with us, and we're here to make that right. And someone else will tell us along the way if we made that right and if we want to contact the divine we do that through another person because we're beneath and cannot do that for ourselves uh, but in this and in in the design of the human form there is this connection to everything and the ability to reach for it and when oh when a human understands that uh, when someone passes over, they're still available and still there, it's just interaction with them in a different way. This brings a new respect for, for the lineage, for what we came from and what we go to. And this brings oh, an understanding of the divinity of the body that we hold and that we should treat this vessel as divine uh, because we're in it to build that cellular memory. And then when we retur return to the one, we continue to interact in that way with those who are here and embodied, with those with the open heart to receive the connection to their ancestry. So there's such a, a lot of information in those simple words you just said at the end. Um, I can feel a lot of information opening up. So I guess um, as we heal ourselves, that heals our whole lineage. As our ancestors continue to grow and evolve, that it's so... In a way, lineage is, is perhaps not the right word, isn't it? It's more like a, a whole ta multi-dimensional tapestry. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, okay, so next question. So the image that came there was the, the spider web or grid or interconnectedness. And if you look at a geometric shape and crystal um, there's a web and weaving of this uh, and and points where beings weave in and out of that it's threading we thread in and out of this web of consciousness and we connect and and reconnect and there seems to be collection of soul family within this where certain beings interact 
in different forms uh, in, in groupings and they re-encounter one another. That's the imagery that came there. That's a fun question. Once a human, always a human? Question mark. Mm, no. <laughs> no, and this vessel is noticed as he sits here today is surrounded by bumblebees uh, and each bee has a soul each flower has a soul the guides can be in the tree they can be in the person sitting across from you they can be in the bee Talking of fun, how can we have more fun? Because we're such a serious species. <laughs> how can we have more fun? The curiosity. Explore like a five-year-old would, with open eyes and wonder. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Because... Spirit is simple, mm. and we make it complicated, don't we? Very much so. And because we overthink everything. So mm. for those members of the council who have had existences on Earth, maybe... Um, because you mentioned that there's an energy there that's almost reminds you of Nikola Tesla, although may or may not be. Um, so maybe they could talk to us about the interface between not just the human body but our intellect and the dominance of the intellect and how that can be a limit and how we can get outside of the intellect to access the le less seriousness and more creative and fun expression. Your planet has a thinking problem. You've been taught to overvalue thought and analytics and this keeps people trapped in in cycles running in circles the the way out of this is to explore more of what's possible and if we say this thought and knowledge are the lowest form available to you and there's much more above this it may expand horizons and have people especially people who are of a competitive nature, look further for maybe there's more available to me. In experiential form, there's lots available to us. We can do with our physical body that is part of what we're here for, our energetic body, and, and different ways through our existence. When a person learns how to activate these and, and dive into the different ways of expanding, this is a place of creation. This is a place where a human can experience what it is like to be God in human form. This is a level of mastery that's available to everyone here if we can get beyond the thinking problem. So that brings me full circle <laughs> to one of the branching points in our conversation where you were earlier talking about um, out-of-body experience and how there's... Um, 
so much of our own existence that we don't know and how that at various times on the planet there have been education systems that have taught people these things but currently our school system is quite limited it's quite focused on the intellect the majority of it so let's talk a little bit about education and the education system here and perhaps the evolution of that education system um because there is so much you see uh that we're not calvin Mm, yeah, we see Calvin here saying coaching coaching is the answer to education's failure to create genius. So in in education, if we roll back through civilizations, before a time where we sent people into an institution, there was community and exploration and a sharing of knowledge and wisdom. There was demonstration of behavior and, and correction in a way that left the human whole. And these things don't exist in the institutions that we have today. The environment that those institutions were created for no longer exists. And this creates a problem because more and more people and children are rejecting what they know is not for them. And there's some creativity happening, creation happening, where people are looking for a new answer, but they haven't quite let go of the model of the institution, the need to send a child to the school. Instead of forming a community where the child can be, where the child can be free and fostered and cared for. And this comes hmm, with a lot of energy again. This comes in many forms because we see the elder that can teach the child one thing and we see the mother who can teach the child another. And we see peers who teach even more. So if there's a release of the institution and slowly a move away from the recipe that exists today and the design of a new recipe, and we're going to say a remembering of a different way that's possible for teaching people how to master their humanity. These schools have existed on the planet before and the information can be accessed and downloaded for those who are in alignment and can take it further. Thank you. So I think sometimes when we um, resist our evolution, then occurrences happen on the planet that force us to look at ourselves and change. So I don't really want to ask you about this, but the pandemic is one example. But another example, I think, is that we've got this huge inrush of neurodiversity in terms of the people being born onto the planet. So children who are get labeled as autistic adhd um asperger's all these different labels that the medical profession has and while you were speaking it just made me wonder if that is to force us to change the education system because they are the ones that don't fit in into the old system so can you talk a little bit about um I guess how maybe our mass consciousness uses mass events as ways of shifting things. So we see many things there and we're going to step away from the corona. We're going to focus on the diamond that came and the diamond being the new child, the new opportunity. Our best opportunity for the future comes in the newest that we have here today and the newest come with something different than has been here before. And these labels of unwell are only that. Labels, what it means is 
those in positions of authority, those with the responsibility for knowing those who must know, know. But they don't know. And more people are waking up to the fact that there is not an answer and they don't know. So if you were to ask the child, and if we go in to one of these children, they're built differently. Their antenna are activated in a different way. And they are communicating, just not in the form that we are all stuck to. So for the older generations, for the open minds, if they were to learn how to access their abilities, they may learn how to receive these gifts differently. I um I have another question, but um as I before I ask it, I'm going to invite anyone in the audience who would like to ask the council a question. Type it in the chat, and I will do my best to ask um Greg to channel an answer from the council. In the meantime, while you may be typing, one of the things you briefly mentioned was. Um, when we were talking about escape, escaping from pain, you very briefly mentioned mm -hmm. the issues of memory on our planet. And I think that the statistics on that are massive, like maybe one in two people and at least one in three people, as they age, will suffer from some form of memory loss. Is this just a mass denial that's going on? Or is there more to say about that and to help us understand what this is about? There's one thing we're going to come back to, but we'll start here. It's 13% and it's a poisoning. Mm -hmm. And the thing we want to come back to is uh, as we observed that child, we saw it wrapped in plants and this brings plant medicine and this is an answer to both with a reconnection to the planet and a return to holistic uh, medicine where what's available in a plant is a complete solution not a targeted answer to one symptom this can bring a different result so plant plant medicine nature can help with both of these. And Greg's asking, can the poison be reversed? Not for all. So where does the poison come from? Is it a combination of how we are treating our environment and creating our food? Is it all of the pesticides that we spray on the plants and all of the hormones and antibiotics that we put into our meat? Is it the atmosphere that we live in, all the chemicals we spray on our bodies? Is, is that the poison that you're talking about? and the poison taken by choice. So yes, all of these things. And a point that the air is not poison, it's the things that have been put into it. Yeah. And a, also a point on this is, there's not the quantity of things being put in the air that used to be. There's been an intervention. There's been correction on the planet that most people are not aware of. And what we're working through is the the fallout of choices of the past where this gives people the bodily experience and cellular memory of the choices that we made before. People are going to feel their way through this and come out the other side with different answers, or we hope that they come out the other side with different answers. So for those who end the journey of this lifetime, through the experience of dementia and don't reverse it, 
then they continue forward in creating new experiences with the memory of that whole experience as part of their Akash. And every soul has a choice. And if a soul chooses to leave and not complete what they came to do, they will have an opportunity to try again. It seems to me unlikely that all of the millions of people who have memory loss issues will turn that around in their lifetime. What? <laughs> um, and again, so we see the, the souls leaving this planet and being magnetized to the other. So this isn't an ending. It's not going to be easy. It is not an ending. Yeah. Magnetized to the other, as in the two worlds that you were talking about. Yes. And the, the other being the higher vibration world or the lower vibration world? Higher. Higher. So we have been uh, talking for almost an hour. <laughs> And so I think it's time for us to, to, to wrap up our conversation. So I would just ask if there is a final message, because I've steered the conversation, but maybe there are things that you would like to say that I haven't opened up for us. So is there something that, that you would like to finish on? So we feel like the message has been left in a dark place and we want to make sure that what comes through is the, the look forward with hope, the reach for curiosity, the expansion that's possible, the live in the moment and, and find joy in that. Because this, in fact, is the answer to the things that cause us pain and bring us closer to the future that we're all reaching for. That's all. Thank you. And um, one more comment, which I hope doesn't make it in a dark place again. But, um, it, the people who have the memory problems are, by default, living in the moment. <laughs> it struck mm -hmm. me. Sometimes so it happens by choice, and sometimes it happens by force. It's like the alpha male who will not get out of his male channel who suddenly takes an injury and forces him into his female channel to find that balance and understanding we are given opportunity and sometimes we don't take the opportunity and we're given a push and sometimes we don't respond to the push and then we're given a shove when push comes to shove <laughs> thank you so much Greg and the council and thank you everybody who came to listen and I, I really hope you enjoyed as much as I did listening to the messages from the council thank you so much Greg thank you that was wonderful. Oh, I'm hot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we will complete here. I will turn record off.